Hello everybody and welcome back to another anatomy tutorial. Last week we looked at the peritoneal cavity and the organs that filled the peritoneal cavity as well as looking at how to divide the peritoneal cavity into various different spaces. Now this week we're going to look at the retroperitoneum. I'm going to show you how to identify the organs that fill the retroperitoneum as well as showing you how to divide the retroperitoneum into three distinct spaces. So let's start by having a look at the schematic and identifying the organs and then going across to a CT scan and looking at those organs there. Then we'll come back to the schematic and I'll show you how to divide the retroperitoneum. So this is a picture from last week's talk and if you haven't looked at the peritoneal talk I'm going to link it above. Here we can see anteriorly everything shaded in green is our peritoneal cavity. Posterior to that, retro to that is our retroperitoneum which is shaded in this light blue color. We can see this green line is our parietal peritoneum, which is the lining of that peritoneal cavity. You can see our schematic shows a pancreas coming across here, the uncinate head, body, and tail. The kidneys, the left and the right kidney, as well as the adrenal glands that lie superior to those kidneys. And then we can see our aorta and our inferior vena cava. These are all retroperitoneal structures. If we were to head down in the abdomen and a little bit further inferiorly, we can still see our pancreas coming across the abdomen here, our second part of the duodenum as it heads down inferiorly before crossing over. We have our ascending colon on the patient's right and our descending colon on the patient's left. We can still see our aorta and our inferior vena cava as well as our left and our right kidneys. We've lost those adrenal glands because we're a bit lower down now. Posteriorly, we've got muscles here. We've got our psoas muscles that will head down towards the pelvis, eventually join with the iliacus muscles, as well as our quadratus lumborum muscles, and they're lined by a fascia, which we're going to talk about later. So let's have a look at a CT scan and find those organs on the scan. So here we have an axial slice CT scan. It's a normal scan of the abdomen, and as always, I'm going to start in the thorax when we're looking at this abdomen. So let's scroll all the way up to the thorax and then head our way into the abdomen. So as we scroll inferiorly, we can see our liver coming into view on the patient's right-hand side, and we'll see our spleen coming into view on the patient's left-hand side. We can see the diaphragm here separating the thoracic cavity from the abdominal cavity. Now the first retroperitoneal organs that we'll see are our adrenal glands, so I'm going to show you how to find those now. They can sometimes be quite difficult to see. They lie superior to the superior pole of the kidney. We can see our left adrenal gland here. It's got two limbs. It looks like an arrow pointing forward on the patient. So you can see that adrenal gland is superior and slightly anterior to that superior pole of the left kidney. And the same on the right-hand side. We can see our right adrenal gland there. Now, as we scroll down further, we will see our kidneys come into view. And you'll note that the kidneys are surrounded by this dark fat which will become important when we separate the retroperitoneum into its various different spaces. So let's follow those kidneys all the way down and just see them uh, down to the inferior pole. We can scroll back up to the hilum of the kidney where we should see our left renal vein coming across the aorta there, as well as our right renal vein heading into the inferior vena cava here. We can also see our renal arteries as well. And this is where our collecting system becomes our proximal ureter that heads down towards the pelvis along that front edge of the psoas muscle. Now let's identify some of the gastrointestinal structures that are in the retroperitoneum. We'll start by looking at the duodenum. So the stomach is an intraperitoneal structure, and as it gives off the first part of the duodenum, the duodenum heads backwards and becomes a retroperitoneal structure. And that moment it becomes retroperitoneal is the second part of the duodenum. And that second part heads inferiorly, crosses the midline, head superiorly up before becoming the jejunum and becoming an intraperitoneal structure again. So let's start again at the stomach and we can find the duodenum from the stomach. So here's our esophagus coming into the stomach. The stomach heads round a J-shape like that again. And as we follow the stomach down, we'll get down to the pylorus into the first part of the duodenum. That's not a retroperitoneal structure. The second part, D2, is a retroperitoneal structure. We can follow D2 down before it crosses the midline, which is our third part of the duodenum, D3. And then we can scroll up superiorly as that fourth part of the duodenum comes and turns into the jejunum, the DJ flexure there. Then after D4 becomes an intraperitoneal structure. So D2, 3, and 4 are all retroperitoneal. Anterior to that, we should see our pancreas here. Let's find the pancreas. 
A, a nice way to find the pancreas is to find your SMA, your super, superior mesenteric artery, and your pancreas wraps around that SMA. So you can see the unsnit head body of our pancreas, and as we head out, the tail of the pancreas should go towards the spleen. Now this bit of tail of pancreas that you see sticking out is actually an intraperitoneal structure. So our unsnit head and body are retroperitoneal. They've only got one lining of parietal peritoneum on it. But this pancreas actually has a bit of peritoneum wrapping all the way around. So we consider the tail, the distal portion of the pancreas, an intraperitoneal structure. We then have our ascending and descending colon. So if we scroll down inferiorly, we should see our descending colon here on the patient's left-hand side and our ascending colon on the right-hand side. So those are our retroperitoneal structures. Let's go and look at how we can divide the retroperitoneum into three distinct spaces. And I'm gonna go back to our schematic to show you how we do that. So as we can see in the schematic, everything shaded in light blue is our retroperitoneum. And we can see we can divide this retroperitoneum with these fascial planes that separate the peritoneum into different spaces. We can see there's an anterior space here, which is known as our anterior pararenal space, P-A-R-A, -A, pararenal space, our anterior pararenal space. That has our pancreas, our duodenum, as well as our ascending and descending colons. So you can see these are all gastrointestinal structures that fill this space. So some people like to call it the gastrointestinal space. This is our anterior pararenal space. The boundaries of that space, well, anteriorly, we have our parietal peritoneum making up the anterior border here. Posteriorly, this is what's known as our anterior renal fascia. You can see this blue line coming across here is our anterior renal fascia, which is also known as gerota's fascia. You'll hear that commonly used gerota's fascia, our anterior renal fascia. On the sides here, you can see in gray is our lateroconal fascia, where our anterior renal fascia and our posterior renal fascia combine to form this lateral conal fascia. That makes up the lateral borders of our anterior pararenal space or our gastrointestinal space. Then posterior to that, we have our kidneys filling a space that's known as the perirenal space, P-E-R-I, perirenal space. This perirenal space houses our kidneys and our adrenal glands, as well as the proximal ureters and the vessels going into the hilum of the kidney. We can see that the kidneys were surrounded by fat as we saw on that CT scan. So this also has fat filling this space. We know that this anterior border is gerota's fascia or our anterior renal fascia. And then posteriorly, we have a slightly thicker fascia here called Zuckercandel's fascia or our posterior renal fascia. So Gerota's fascia anteriorly, Zuckercandel's fascia posteriorly. If you find it easier to remember, anterior renal fascia and posterior renal fascia. You can see they head towards the midline. Now, some people say that these fascias actually connect. And there is a debate because sometimes when fluid fills in this space, there is crossover between the two spaces. And as you can see, I've drawn a dotted line across here to, to say that sometimes they join, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes these are distinct spaces by themselves. And we had an anterior pararenal space. Now we have a posterior pararenal space. The anterior border of which is our Zuckercandel's fascia or our posterior renal fascia. And then the posterior border here is represented by this purple line. That's our transversalis fascia. that comes along the anterior border of our psoas and our quadratus lumborum muscle. And as I'll show you in our next CT scan, this is all just filled with fat. So we can see dark fat on a CT scan filling this area. And sometimes when we take an X-ray, we see this stripe of fat here lining the abdomen, which is our pre-peritoneal fat there, coming from our retroperitoneum here, heading all the way around. So this is our posterior pararenal space. We've made our three spaces. Now, some people like to divide it slightly further and make a compartment here by itself, which doesn't have defined fascial borders, but we call it the compartment of the greater vessels. So we can see our aorta and our inferior vena cava, and that actually has communication with our posterior mediastinum coming up forward. So some people call this a distinct space, the compartment of our greater vessels. And some people call this vertebral body, as well as our psoas and quadratus lumborum, call this our posterior space which is technically not a retroperitoneal space. That's a retro retroperitoneum outside of the peritoneum there. So we've seen where these planes intersect on an axial slice. 
Now, it's sometimes important to know that this renal space, this perirenal space, heads superiorly, and on the right-hand side, there's a section of liver that doesn't actually have parietal peritoneum attaching. It just goes liver straight to diaphragm. There's a free bit of liver there. And this perirenal space superiorly communicates with that free edge of the liver. On the patient's left-hand side, that goes up to the left subphrenic or left diaphragm on the top. Heading down inferiorly, that perirenal space, the anterior and posterior renal fascia, or our gerotas and Zucker candles fascia, fuse to form our combined interfascial plane, which I can show you on a lateral section here. So we get our bearings. Anterior here is our peritoneal cavity. You can see our duodenum crossing the midline, our descending or our ascending colon on this side, filling our anterior pararenal space. Now the inferior borders of this space are less well defined and often when you get fluid collecting in here that can actually track into the pelvis. We can see our perirenal space here with our adrenal gland and our kidneys. Anteriorly is our gerotus fascia, posteriorly is our Zucker candles fascia. They fuse to form the combined interfascial plane. And then we've got this fat-filled space here, our posterior pararenal space, which is our posterior border of our transversalis fascia. So I'm going to show you a CT scan that has some pathology and makes these fascial planes a lot easier to identify. So let's have a look at that. So we have an axial slice CT scan here in a patient that has a disease called retroperitoneal fibrosis. And you can see this low attenuating soft tissue around the aorta, which is calcified and has atherosclerosis. And that pulls all of the structures surrounding it towards the aorta there. But you also get this fibrosis that makes our gerotus fascia and our zuccal candles fascia a bit thicker and a bit easier to see on a CT scan. So if we orientate ourselves, we can see our right kidney and our left kidney. We can see that perirenal space quite clearly here. Anterior renal fascia or our gerotus fascia coming behind the descending colon. We can see our Zucker candles fascia as well. Let's try and see it clearer here. Joining our anterior renal fascia or gerotus fascia, forming our lateral conal fascia before it then goes and fuses with our parietal peritoneum. So you can see that space really clearly here. Posterior to that, so we've got our Zucker candles fascia, our posterior renal fascia, making the anterior border of our posterior pararenal space where we have the transversalis fascia making up that posterior border. You can see the fat in there heading all the way around to the side of the abdomen there. As we head inferiorly, we will see that our gerotus fascia and our Zucker candles fascia come together to fuse, and that's our combined interfascial plane there. We can head up superiorly and look at our gastrointestinal compartment where we have our pancreas coming across here. There will be parietal peritoneum coming across that pancreas, going to the anterior border of this descending colon. We can also look for our duodenum here. There's some contrast in the stomach, as you can see, so we can follow this quite nicely. We'll be able to see the duodenum heading posteriorly, down inferiorly, before crossing the midline, D3, heading up superiorly, D4, before going at our DJ flexure to our jejunum. So all of that is retroperitoneal. We can see that anterior to gerotus fascia here, will be our anterior pararenal space that has our duodenum, our descending and ascending colon, as well as our pancreas coming forward. As we head up superiorly, we can see then our adrenal gland still within our perirenal space, and we can see our posterior pararenal space also closing out here. And this right-hand perirenal space will eventually come to this free border of the liver, which doesn't have any parietal peritoneum. It comes in direct contact with that right diaphragm. On the left hand side, that left perirenal space opens up to that left diaphragm there. So there we have it, we can split the retroperitoneum into three different segments. We can also look at an x-ray I thought I'd be interesting to show you. As we see that posterior pararenal space coming round with a fat in that space, we can see on an x-ray we can see that preperitoneal fat stripe coming along here. We can often think that this is air within the abdomen, but that's just that retroperitoneal fat coming around the sides of the abdomen there, the posterior border of which is our transversalis fascia, and the anterior border by the time it gets to here is actually our peritoneum, so it's on the outside of our peritoneal cavity. So I hope that helps. I hope you can look at the retroperitoneum and be able to split it into its three compartments, the anterior pararenal space, 
the perirenal space and our posterior pararenal space, and then identify the various things that fill those spaces. And whenever we have pathology, if we have a renal cyst that bursts, we will see it will only fill those particular spaces. So when you know the spaces, it becomes a bit easier to identify where the pathology is in itself. So if you've liked the video, I'd encourage you to please give it a like, show me that you've liked it, as well as leaving a comment below as to what other videos you'd like me to do. And as always, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, I'd love if you would do that. Share it with someone that might find it helpful. And until next time, I'll see you all. Goodbye.